Will you write down a sentence, please? And will you please let yourself go enough to react fully to the sentence? There is no shame like the shame of seeing I've been an utter fool all my life. There's no shame like the shame of seeing that I've been an utter fool all my life. There's no shame like the shame of seeing I've been an utter fool all my life. You know that very few human beings ever permit themselves this saving shame. And you in this room and you listening to this tape up to this point of your life have never, have never permitted yourselves to be shamed into salvation. Shall I use a non-religious term? Shamed into deliverance. Shamed into the self-destruction that destroyed your ideas that you were intelligent and then found out with great shame and disgrace and humiliation that you've been a fool all your life. You don't know that yet. That's why we meet here so often to try to get it through our systems that we are foolish and have been up to this point in our life. I'm going to tell you a story, illustration, that will deepen your understanding of many things that we've talked about in this class. And maybe, for some of you, we'll make clear for the first time certain ideas about ourselves, what we're made of, and how we can change it. You'll begin to see what I'm talking about as I proceed with the illustration. You'll get it. You'll see. Imagine yourself the owner of a large, beautiful mansion out in the country. Very beautiful place with lakes all around and pretty hills. And room for dozens of people there. And you are the owner of it. And so you have lots of guest rooms which are filled up all the time with people who visit you and stay there for quite a while. Some stay quite a while and then leave. Some come overnight, but friends are coming and going. Dozens of friends are coming and going. And you're very wealthy. You have a lot of money and you can afford them. Because it's all your mansion. It's all yours. And so you have good times together and you go out and you go boating and you play games together and you have nice banquets and you enjoy each other's company. Except, of course, uh, your friends being human, you being human, they're little things that make you a bit unhappy and make them a bit unhappy, but it seems as if the life is going pretty, pretty well, not too bad. So this goes on for a long time. And you begin to, one day, one period in your life, you begin to think a little bit more about your life, what it's all about, what you're doing here on earth. But it doesn't penetrate very much because you're having so much fun. Just so many actions going on, people coming in, girlfriends, boyfriends, the whole business, all of life is going on. So it doesn't penetrate you too much about what life is all about. What life is all about is what you're doing. You're enjoying it. You're having fun. But one time, you begin to notice something strange going on in your mansion. You notice, for example, that one night, one of the valuable chairs that was in the hallway, antique chair, was missing. All of a sudden, you walk down the hall in the morning, and the chair was gone. You don't know what happened to it. You ask around. No one seems to know what happened to it. So you don't pay too much attention to it. But a couple nights later, uh, you go out in the yard or out in the, during the day, you go out in the yard, you notice that 
a number of the branches of your fruit tree is broken off. Someone just ripped them off and done damage to your fruit trees out there. And you begin to notice other strange little things going on that displease you. Small things missing, damage being done around the property inside and outside. Someone's being careless with your property. So it gets to the point where you think you better do something about it. You're not sure who's doing it. So you call all your guests together and you ask them, uh, do you know what's going on here? Did you know the chair was missing? Someone wrecked the fruit trees out there. Does anyone know what happened? And all your friends quite solemnly assure you they, they don't know. They didn't see anyone doing that. One of them suggests that maybe it's uh, s someone from the village down the street, a few miles down this highway, just snuck in at night and taken your property and broke, broke thing. So you ask them to um, keep alert, keep an eye open on things to see uh, if you find out what's happening. You don't want your property hurt. So they agree. Oh, yes, they quite cheerfully agree to keep an eye open. After all, they're your guests in the house. They don't want you, the host, to be unhappy. So a few more weeks pass, but the damage continues. This time a valuable painting you have down in the big hall, big uh, main room downstairs there, one of the valuable paintings disappears. Shortly after that, some of your silverware disappears and more damage is done out in the yard. It gets to the point where you're getting a little bit irritated, more than irritated. And you think you'd better do something more severe about it, so you call your friends in again. This time your face is a little sterner and you tell them, look, we're all friends here and we want to enjoy each other, but I can't tolerate the theft or the damage that's going on around here I, and I don't know who's doing it, what's happening and some of your friends tell you, you know I really do believe it's those people down in the village a few miles away look very easily, the fence is easy to scale and I have no doubt Mr. Host that they're breaking in here at night when we're not watching and stealing your things and damaging your property however, this time your guests assure you we have been careless, we haven't been good guests as we should be, so from now on we're going to be very careful and try to catch who's ever doing all this damage. Sorry we failed you, we won't fail you anymore. So you feel quite assured and feel comfortable now that you're going to have cooperation in stopping the damage and thievery. But it continues. Even more things are gone and windows are broken and you don't know what to do about it. You just don't know what to do. It's just happening quite mysteriously, and you've got all your friends watching out for you. Two or three dozen friends are watching at night who said they'll even stay up and watch for you, and still it continues. You don't know what to do. You finally decide there's only thing, one thing for you to do, which is to stay awake at night and just watch what happens yourself personally. You've been going to bed at night, uh, assured that the other people were going to help you. And they didn't or couldn't. You're not quite sure what's going on, so you decide to stay awake yourself one night. So you get in a dark corner up above the main room there where you can't be seen, and you can look down and you can see everything that's going on down in the main room. You can see people coming in, doors and exiting. So you sit up there at midnight on, staying wide awake, just to see what's going on down there. And about one o'clock, you see the door open down there, and you look carefully. You can see in the dark pretty good, because you're wide awake. And you see, and guess what you see? You see your best friend stealing one of your pictures. You can't believe it. Well, this is the man who stood there and vowed to you that he was going to catch the thief. And he's the thief himself. He carts off the picture. You keep watching and you, you see another friend, one of your, another best friend, a lady friend. She seems so nice and so pleasant. And there she's copying something, putting it in her purse. 
to your shock and amazement, of course, you find out you've been robbed by the people that you thought were your friends, the people who were living in your house and living, uh, it's eating at your table, There's dozens around the table, and every practically every one of them was a thief because you sat there night after night after night until you saw what was going on. Practically all of them, except maybe two or three, were stealing you left and right, stealing your property. You understand the point so far? We'll come back to the story, perhaps, but do you understand the point so far? The mansion is your life, the life principle. The guests are the hundreds of ideas and beliefs and compulsions and emotions and desires and drives. All these thoughts and feelings that you have, that I have inside of us, that we and our foolish trust and gullibility have believed are our friends. Remember we said that we don't we don't see anger as the enemy, we don't see jealousy, we don't see these compulsions as the enemy. Why? Why? We foolishly trusted them because we prefer to remain asleep and pretend that all is well. We're going to have to wake up, are we not? Do you see how the, how the point of self-observation, which you have heard so many times of being watchful, enters into this? Up to this point, we haven't been watchful at all. We've had our happiness stolen away. We've had our self-command swiped by that attitude, by that unseen thief in the night that we couldn't see because we were laying in our beds and dreaming that all was well. See what happened to that man has to happen to us too, doesn't it? He has to get to the point. Listen to this very, very carefully. Don't you ever forget this if you want to wake up. That man got to the point that you and I are have to, going to have to get to, which is to bear the shocking shame of seeing what an utter fool we have been all our lives. You have not, none of you in this room or listening to this tape have reached this point yet. You don't have the courage yet. You don't have the courage to say, I'm going to stay wide awake all day long, all night long. Watch these thoughts as they creep into my mind, creep into my feeling, creep into my behavior and steal away everything that's authentically valuable to me, including command of my own life. We don't do that. Back to the, I'll, I'll tell you, if you remember anything besides the story, remember the fact how we refuse the humiliation of ourselves. We refuse the shame of seeing that we have been foolish about everything. Not only that, when you begin to detect all these treacherous guests inside of you, you know the next thing you, listen, listen, you know the next thing you're going to have to do is to tell them to get out. All these guests are going to have, you're going to have to tell them to get out. You've stolen my property, you've stolen my life long enough. And look at the terror that's going to bring on you. Living in this house all alone, but I need friends. You need friends who steal your property. We've learned the answer to that in this class, which is this. We don't at all have the strength to tell a hundred phony guests at a time to get out and stay out. But we do have the strength to catch, catch one in the act and walk right up to it and confront it and say, say to it, this is the last time you're going to deceive me. This is the last time you're going to steal anything away from me. A compulsive idea, for example. Don't you see a compulsive idea as a thief keeps running through your mind and telling you that it's necessary for you to think that jealous thought? 
necessary for you to try to strike back at people who you say think have hurt you? We can indeed take one thought at a time as we're able to catch it and say, this is the last time you're going to steal from me. I'm putting you out right now. <coughs> there is no progress in the inner life without first going through the shame of seeing how gullible you've been toward all these people who have lived inside you. You wanted to play the game with them? They played the game with you. Of course they did. They're getting their food and lodging. They don't have the responsibility for the keeping the mansion up. You do. You have the responsibility for your own life. Do you think all these little evil imps inside of you care one bit for your life, for your life principle? The only thing they care about is to use you all they can, and then you know what they're going to do? They're going to desert you. Your friends, so-called friends, are going to desert you. That's their, that's their nature, to use you and then run away. And I'll guarantee you that every one of us in this room have had friends just like that, and the reason they did that is because you were trying to do the same thing to them, right? Amen. So whose fault was it? Are you willing to begin to endure loneliness by telling them to get out? Catch them in the first place. Maybe we better start with first things first. Tell them to get out. I'm not going to put up with you anymore. Understand the point of it? Yes. See how this connects with everything else we've talked about, including the fact that we're the one thing that we're asleep to is the delusion, the illusion that we are one single person all the time, operating firmly and all that from, from ourselves when there are really dozens of people inside us lying to us, one taking over, another one taking over the next minute. Now, do you remember we have talked, I have told you that you cannot change your inner nature without first collapsing? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. right, let me repeat it then. There is no way for any man or woman to be born again authentically, not in the phony Christian way, but to change the kind of nature he has without first collapsing in utter, utter shame, in utter weakness, going right in, fully into his hopelessness, so that your life collapses without you trying to do anything about it. Because if you do anything about it, then you'll simply switch from one false guest in you to another false guest. And you won't change a thing, and you'll still be at the mercy of the guests which have simply changed their disguises. All right. The collapse of you, the false self, the invented self, the artificial nature, the collapse begins as you detect the thieves in the night, the anger, the hatred, the jealousy, as you detect them and then know that they have no value to you at all, on the other hand, they have great harm to you, and then tell them that you're not going to put up with them anymore. When you say, I am not going to tolerate you anymore because I see through you, that is your collapse. That is the collapse of your belief in the false parts of you that have sustained you so precariously up to this point. It is also not only collapse, but it is the entering voluntarily, voluntarily entering into a far deeper hell than you've ever known before. Unless you are willing to live all alone, I said all alone, no friends at all, unless you are willing to live all alone in that mansion, 
you'll never understand yourself. You'll never own that mansion completely. You'll, you'll never know what to do with it authentically until you collapse, that is, let go of all your false guests so that they're out, so that you come to the next horror of living all alone in it. As you begin to live all alone in it, a miracle happens. You'll see someone walking up the driveway and you can tell, you can tell at a glance that he or she, this new guest, this new friend, is decent. From another distance, another man or a woman comes up. And you can tell by, just by, you can tell a block away. You really can. You can tell a block away that that person is a decent person and you invite him or her to have a guest room. Pretty soon, the whole mansion is filled, huh? We're filled with right intentions, with, with right facts, with real encouragement, with truth. With all the facets, with all the elements that truth has, you have filled it up. Now you're in command of the whole castle because these are all your friends and there can't be any division between them. What caused you, what gave you the power to a block away recognize from that man's expression and his manner, her manner, what caused you to be able to look at that person and say, this is the kind of a new guest that I want. I'll tell you what gave you that perception. And the only thing that will give it to you. Booting out, booting out the thieves in the night, living all alone in the mansion until your perception grew, the falseness went, and with the emptying of the false, your perception grew so that one part of you, your, your life itself, began to be true. What recognizes trueness? Trueness. You have grown having the courage to boot them out, to live alone, and as you did that, God himself begins to work with you. Then you, in your new nature, you, you d don't know how it's happening exactly because it's very mysterious, but very definite, and you'll see it very definite in your life. Your new nature, your nature of light, is what sent the message to that right person over that, that person uh, whose whose name is honesty, see, and that woman over there whose name is earnestness, that that man over there whose name is right intention to work. They begin to live in the mansion, and ah, now is there any division between that true person and this true person? They're all one. There's no fighting. There's no squabble. And is there any self deception? You don't steal from yourself. When you are one, when you're honest, how do you hurt yourself? You can't hurt yourself. So in this unity, the mansion is happy. And you're not, you're not deceiving yourself by thinking that those are friends out there and you're not depending on them. You know, I'll tell you, and then we'll, I'll end this part of it. The process I have just described to you in about 25 minutes may take you 10 years, it may take you 20 years, it may take you 30 years, not weeks, not months. But it can be done, so you're going to have to start. Are you willing to start? Hmm? You'll say yes. You'll say yes. All right, fine. Do you know the things you're going to encounter? Let me give you just a few examples, and you, you already suspect this because you already encountered them. Remember, remember all these treacherous friends are in here, right? They may be out there too, but you're deceived by them out there because you're first consenting to them in here. You begin to see how many false friends inside you have to, you have to stay wide awake, you know, you have to be watching them, and how, how they're going to lie to you how they're going to pretend, how they're going to take argument, for example, as strength, how they're going to take sarcasm as knowledge. What a ridiculous thing. Sarcasm as knowledge. One thing that will help you go faster on what we're talking about 
is my insistence to you that you begin to see what utter, use that word again, what utter devils practically every human being on earth is. Now don't you lighten it. Do you know what a devil is? A devil is vicious. Now don't you think of him as a cute little man in a red suit. A devil will murder you for two cents. You'll go, listen to this, you'll go much faster in emptying your mansion, your life, this is your life we're talking about, of these thieves, of these cutthroats, much faster if you don't be stupid and think people are nice. They're not nice. They're devils. And you don't know what I just said. You don't know it inside. This is why I feel very sorry, in one sense, you understand, for all the pain you're going to have to go through when you get hurt by people you trust. You think they're their, your friends? Both out there and the devils in you or in me have been stealing from us from the day we were born. And we had better start to wake up and sit up there on that balcony and look down and see exactly what they're doing to us. If you insist on remaining in your bedroom, staying asleep, and dreaming beautiful dreams of the picnic you're going to have tomorrow with all your friends, you're going to be scared, you're going to be hostile, you're going to be fearful, and you know what else? You're going to despise yourself. You're going to despise yourself for being the actual coward that you are. How nice that there is guidance that can make us understand our actual situation living in that mansion, can begin to explain to us very kindly where we are making a mistake, and then tell us exactly how we can proceed every day of our life to begin to undo all the damage we've permitted up to this point in our life. Aren't you glad? How many of you would say you have some pretty uh, treacherous guests in your house? Huh? Make you miserable? They steal your property? They betray you? They're, they are, listen, they are living their life at the expense of your life? Right. Right, Rod? Yeah. Whose fault? The man asleep in the bedroom, dreaming beautiful daydreams, night dreams, <laughs> night dreams, nightmares, about all the fun he's going to have tomorrow with all his nice, loyal friends. And incidentally, do you, do you know that all of the, these friends, uh, these guests hate each other as well as you? Don't you, you know why they hate you? Because you're a sucker. Of course they do. They despise your weakness. Just think. You're despised by what you call your best friends. All right, go to work. Who are some of these treacherous friends you're harboring? You won't give up. Who won't you boot out? Zena, who won't you boot out in there? How about uh, sobbing? You sob? <laughs> I'm, I could have got a better example. Dorothy, who are you keeping in there? You should be booting out. <clears throat> jealousy. Jealousy. Why do you value jealousy? I don't know. It's so painful. Why do you value your pain? Well, yes. Uh, well, we've gone through this never, never pun. Look, if you boot out jealousy and anger and a hope for the future, which is phony, and artificial 
personality. If you boot them out one by one, your phony friends start leaving the mansion, you know you're going to feel lonely, don't you? You would rather have familiar but treacherous friends than facing the loneliness. Don't you understand? And as you face it, you'll never smash it. Don't you know that you're lonely with your friends? How can, how can treachery ever make you feel good? How can a man who's bopping you, who's stealing from you, make you feel good? It's only the absence of treacherous friends that can make you feel good. Because lo and behold, you are the treacherous friend. That is what you are now. Dorothy, you're your jealousy. You were it. Aren't you? Huh? Don't you feel jealous? That's all, you're, all you consist of at that moment. You love the feeling of that. This class, among other things, is to help us all get the courage to say, get out and stay out. And many interesting things happen when you do that. That smiling jealousy that you now love so much, watch how it turns into a sneering, snarling devil. Have you ever ever had a good friend turn on you? Come on. Ever had a friend turn on you? Huh? Was he your friend before he turned on you? Not really. He was just waiting for the opportunity to turn on you. Once he got what he wanted, once you ran out of money or whatever he wanted from you. It was a marvelous illustration of that. Let me pass it on. In the movie called The Informer, remember it, The Informer? It was a, a, it's an old movie, but it's around on TV. Uh, Victor McLaughlin yes. was in it. Remember that? And it was a story of a, an Irishman back in the 1920s who betrayed uh, his their friends, their Irish friends, to the British, and he was he was given a reward for it. And he he got the reward for betraying his friend and eventually got caught by his own people and put out of the way. But at one point, he was, he was a very foolish man, dull-witted, and he was throwing all this money around, buying everybody fish and chips down in Dublin. <laughs> fish and chips? That's funny. <laughs> and one of the hangers-on, one of the you know, treacherous guests in his house was a uh, a man who went around flattered him. Here he is, big Jippo, the the king of the Dublin and all that. Finally, Jippo, which was his movie name, ran out of money, and he told his friend, "Look, I don't have any money left. I spent all the reward money." And his friend turned just as we were talking about his whole nature, his faith. Oh, you don't have any more money. Well, let me tell you what I really think of you. And he started to go away. Then there was a, a double catch on that, all of a sudden Jippo finally found out he had a lot more money and he held up. Oh, you're such a nice man, Jippo, come on, we be funny. And the dummy took his friend back again, until he ran out of money again. What would you like to talk about? What story would you like to tell? <laughs> this is serious, right? Yes. One of my best friends is the dull, passive stupor I find myself in continually that you make it very difficult to listen to. That's very good, and we haven't discussed that very often, have we? A dull stupor. Yeah. Put yourself in a hypnotic state. <laughs> you like that, Ernesto? <laughs> this uh, a boredom is a pretty strong thing. The end of the day is over, and you've got your dinner done and the dishes are done, but you have another three hours before we have to go to bed. Do you know who gets bored? A nitwit who doesn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's one, there's only one way to get out of it, and that's to go, uh, well, you can do anything, anything but 
one way, but it's still painful, is to go do a third line work or something. Call Joan up on the phone. And All right. An awakened state can never be a state of boredom. Never. Boredom is always on the level of the intellect. You've just run out of things to do with your brain. Why don't you, when you, the next time that happens, why don't you leap above your brain? How many have a brain? <laughs> I'll tell you, look, leaping above your brain is the same thing as the fear, not leaping above your brain, is the same thing as the fear of telling your phony friends to get out and stay out. Because your, your, intellect, your intellectual thoughts, which have been so familiar to you, are the only thing you've known, the only thing that's kept you active, out having fun and games and all that, and you want to keep that going. Therefore, you abide by their treachery, you put up with the pain, rather than explore what it means to not have anyone in that mansion but yourself. Yes, Donnie. What tells them to get out? What tells them to get out? The one right part of you. Truth itself. Your real nature. Use any synonym you want. Look. There is a part of you that had better begin rebuking the wrong parts of you. You would better begin to rebuke them. And being the cowards that they are, they'll try all kind of tricks first to discourage you because they're watching you to see whether you're weak or not. But if you keep, keep awake, which is the same thing as keeping strong, they'll get scared and go away. Did you say uh, early this evening that it's possible to be uh, conscious while you are sleeping? Say that again, please. Can you be conscious while you are in the state uh, of sleeping? Can, can you be conscious while we're sleeping? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Or can it be daylight when it's midnight? No, I mean when you're sleeping, uh, physically. Oh, no, no, no. That's another state. Forget that for now. You can, be, you can be awake in a certain way when you're physically asleep. In a certain way. Very alert, by the way. You can even hear a little bird twittering out the branch out there if you want to. You if you want to. Are you are sleeping? Yes, indeed. Very wide awake. Not in the same way, though, in this state. Yes, Donnie. Last uh, week you told Joe that you think you can stop lying. So in other words, we also think that we can tell these friends to get out. But for it to really happen, it can't be us. Oh, no, no. That, the one intellect, uh, yeah, telling another intellectual thought is just playing the game. For, and you know what happens when you do that? Then you become strong in false personality. You become a very firm person who has his convictions. You call it loyalty to God when it's really loyalty to your own neurosis. Do you understand? You, well, maybe we better explain. When, when your friends start to depart, that is the same as your death. The dissolution of your false surface invented personality, isn't it? This, and this has been your life up until now, lying with these people, uh, out playing games, pretending your friends, and all the time they were treacherous to you. As they begin to go, this is why you don't want them to go, because this is all the, the only life you've ever known up to this point. So it is the beginning of your proper death. That is, the death of the delusory self that brings life. Unless they go, the real can't come. This is so simple, isn't it? Isn't that simple? 
You have to die before you can live. You're, we're not living now. We're existing with all these false friends. As we begin to die, that makes the room, all these guest rooms, are empty. They can be filled up with something. The same thing that said get out and stay out is the same power, same cosmic consciousness that recognizes that friend over there as an authentic friend, a friend who wants to work on himself. Real energy, for example. And along with that, get this, along with that, there, here comes someone over from this direction over there and you watch him or her very carefully at a glance you know that that's one of your old treacherous friends who's put on a new mask and you just all you have to all you have to do is look at them to know you can tell by the way they walk to, uh, a block away you can tell by the way they walk by the way they behave and you know something I've done it all the, all the time in this class, and some of you may have done this without knowing it. Haven't you seen someone come into this class that you know there's something wrong with them at first glance? Huh? Yeah. All right. We can do it very easily physically out there, or our, your friends, your relatives. How about your relatives? You know there's something wrong. How about looking inwardly and seeing the way they behave, the way they walk, the way they talk? You ever catch, catch yourself talking falsely, mm -hmm. behaving falsely? Mm -hmm. Can't you catch that a block away and say, no, sir, you're not coming into this house anymore? Tom? Their voices are even different. That's right. They are actually physically different. That's right. And I, I like that. Uh, you said, uh, if you insist on, on old ways, above all, you will despise yourself. Mm -hmm. All right, I want, I'll make it, let's make an experiment, all of us included, for the, for the rest of the meeting tonight and for all of next weekend. I probably won't repeat this, so you have to remember, this is your work. And this, this is both out there and in here. I want you to, to detect a lying tone of voice, that's all, no more than that. You're to, to concentrate your attention on detecting a lying tone of voice in anyone, including yourself. For example, you're trying to convince someone of something that's true that you know really isn't true. Watch your own voice, how it changes. Well, don't you see that this is what I had to do? See, I'm lying, right? I had to do it. Really, I did. You, you catch that in yourself and then other people. Narrow it down to that, okay? When a guest part of me is dominant, <clears throat> I have to look through it, too. I look through it, and that's how I see the world. An example of mine is like uh, a good guy image or something like that. Nice and guy. I don't really see what's going on outside. How can you? Images always see what they want to see, what they need to see, right? My candidate, if you vote for my candidate, it'll be a much better state, much better world. That is an image talking, because that image is getting some kind of a, a advantage, some kind of life from saying he wants that candidate elected. He's my brother-in-law or something. Or he promised to appoint me to high office or something. Is there anything more practical than this? This is daily stuff, isn't it? Right. <clears throat> you know, Vernon, when you say about, you take the voice, 
to see their line, you know, and ourselves or somebody else. Well, last week I was going to go to California, that I changed my plans and I called my daughter-in-law to tell her that I wasn't going. She was telling me oh, how sorry she was, but you see her voice was not going with the words, you know, she was, right. <laughs> her voice wasn't sad at all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Why? <clears throat> because sleeping people have no ability to do anything but lie. Now you don't know this, please, I know I say this before, but you don't know this yet. You don't know a complete liar when you see one. You just catch a little lie here and there. Because <clears throat> you're, still, you're still impressed by people. You still want that man to know what he's talking about, especially when he's talking about something. <coughs> or your self-interest is involved <clears throat> or maybe he looks like <clears throat> he's handsome Larry one of your books is the story of the two people that met one asked the other how are you doing he said fine and the first one re-questioned are you really doing fine the second one reiterated how well he was doing and the first one said you forgot to tell your face right as I think of that uh, when I stretch a story out of shape, which is the same as lying, or I'm trying to act happy when I'm not, I try to ask myself, are my words in my face saying the same thing, am I one at the moment? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could we return to our method of requiring the guests to depart? This was a question really that Dolly was asking and you pointed out that if simply on the intellectual level we demand that they go, the person doing the demanding is on the same level as the person who is doing the conning and so it's just a standoff. Could you comment yeah. on that? Oh sure. Look, at the very start, you know, what tell a guest, guest to go is awareness, the light. Mm -hmm. the, the guests don't want the light. Look, you turn on, turn, there's a thief in the room here, and you come in and turn on the light, he's going to run. He doesn't want to get caught, right? So it's, it's really turning on the light. But that's a later, look, we're beginners, we're amateurs, right? Yes. All right, do you know what amateurs can have? They can have right attitudes. Yes. I've told you a dozen times, there is such a thing as right ideas. It's a right idea to be here tonight. Now, you can begin to see that you don't want to tolerate thieves anymore. Isn't that a right idea? Isn't that the beginning of telling that thief to get out? Yeah. Uh, are, are, are there anyone here who's tired of being a slave to yourself? Huh? All right. All right. Now you raised your hand. You're not awake yet, but that's a right idea. That's the beginning to tell the thieves to get out of my life. They're not going to meekly obey. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. They're going to lie to you. They're going to come back in different disguises. They're going to bring their friends along. And they're going to try to beat you up. <laughs> That's their business to try to beat you up. They have no other business but to hurt you. Get tough. Don't you be polite to the devil. When will you learn that? Now you can begin to have that right attitude. The devil is anything that is injuring your life, whether it's in you or in your wife or husband or friend or whatever. Never mind where the devil is. He's all around, inside and outside. But if you get him out of here, he can't have power over you out there. Because there's no correspondence between the two. The devil in you will be, quote mark, friends with the devil out there in order to gang up on you to destroy you. That's right. I'm not saying just saying that. I know it's a fact. I know that the devil is a coward. Men must 
have other cowards around him. Sniveling little cowards. And if you join them, you're a sniveling little coward yourself. If you have anything to do with them. Go ahead, Zena. I've watched on TV, like Phil Donahue's show, and somebody will get up and meekly say something, and they're not just sure of the response. And then I've watched their face change when the audience, you know, maybe gives a clap, and you can almost, like they've got an ally. And I've watched this in myself, the feeling that comes up when I know I got an ally. You still want allies? No, I don't, but I guess I do. But I, I, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm trying to watch all these reactions inside right. myself. Right. And I've seen the, you know, the false, the falseness come forth when I know I've got somebody on my side. You don't need anyone else. No one at all. Not even your own husband, Zena. You don't need your own husband on your side. If he's on the side of truth, that's a different matter. <clears throat> In order to tell a guest to get out, you have to see it coming. Is that right? No, no. Well, you have to know his nature then your right nature will not want anything to do with his wrong nature. That's before you actually become the guest, right? Pardon? Before you actually become that guest. Become that guest? You, you have to sense its nature before you actually are in the middle of it. That it doesn't... No. Is that you or me that's mixed up? <laughs> Try again. All right. Well, Leland, go ahead. I think she's saying that we have to stand back and observe what is going on before we can begin to have any emotional response to what is going on that will clear up the situation. I think. All right. All right. Saying. Look. How many of you have ever been betrayed by another human being, big way or little way? Been betrayed by someone? All right. The betrayal came about because you were stupid, right? right? You were asleep in the bedroom dreaming what a marvelous friend he or she is, right? right? All right. What is the pain you have to go through seeing that you are, were a stupid, sleeping gullibler, right? You have to go through that in order, in order to be able to recognize the devil in you which was so weak as to be taken by the devil in that other person. All right, Jim. Well, I think a good example, when I look back, of telling these guests to get out. Uh, I came home last night and Zena was over talking to a, a friend. Yeah. And I could see... Resentment coming up. What's she doing over there? And things coming. And I said, Well, you know, I can't afford to go along with that because I want to destroy myself. And it kept coming. I had to keep kicking it. it kept, you know. Right. That, and, that's uh, good. Yeah. Finally, it, it it left. When she came home. <laughs> <laughs> No waiting to pounce or whatever. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. Little devils like that that want to take us. You were unhappy when you had that feeling, were you right. not, Jim? Yeah, right. See? See? You permitted that guest to take away your unhappiness. And I could, I could see I, I was just going to destroy myself. Right. In, you, know, just... you were awake a little bit looking down and seeing the thief steal something. Right. Your happiness. Go ahead, Lynn. I believe what Dottie was saying connects with what you were talking about earlier, <clears throat> namely that we must experience the shame completely that this is in fact what our life is. As long as we say, as long as we stand back and say the person observing is not what is going on, we'll never feel the complete shame, the complete shock of what our life actually is. Look, look, look. That's so simple. Just see how dumb you are. 
You think you think that's easy? You think that's easy? No. That's very difficult. It's all, yeah. Uh, I'm very brave here, but when I'm at home, I don't want to look. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I got a phone call today, and I really seen some shame, you know, it's from my past. And uh, I really was, I was other people around when I was talking, and it really, there was a shock. And then it was trembling afterwards, before I walked into class. The only thing I come out of my mind is go forward trembling and I understood what you meant. Okay. Find out, look, there are 100 phony guests living in the mansion, stealing our food, our pictures, draining us of energy. So, you catch one of them and take care of it as thoroughly as you can, which means this. Try to find out what awful thing will happen to you if you boot him out once and for all. You'll be so surprised to find out instead of feeling worse, you'll feel better. But you first have to go through the shock of saying, what bad thing will happen to me if I boot my friend out? Why, we, we used to, to hunt foxes together on the fields and have banquets together. Yet hit the man, the guy stealing my pictures. Find out what your life will be out if you tell him this is it. This is the end of our friendship. So there's just one vacant room and the rest are still filled with your phony friend. Get rid of one and find out what happens. You'll feel right after you go through the shock. There's something, there's something in us that doesn't want to give up false friends, friends that are keeping us down. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I, I suggest that the, the biggest thing that's keeping us from doing that is the inability to clearly define these friends that are keeping us down. To deliberately what? To, to, del to deliberately name and define the things that are keeping us down. All right. That's the something in us that... All right. Some time ago, Vernon, you commented that your only hope in waking us up was to, I've forgotten exactly how you put it, but the expression was to excite or to raise the level of our anger, of our rage, to such a degree that we couldn't escape it, that it, because it was so intense that it was inescapable. This is what Rod is talking about. It must get there. That's why, as we say in the work, things must get worse before they get better. Yes. And to connect with that then, Gordon, if you're sitting up above in this balcony at midnight, looking down into the main room there where you can see everything going on and all of your property down there, if you see one friend come in and steal something, that's a shock. This is just the beginning of your shocks. And you mustn't say, well, that's too bad. Maybe he has a, a bit of weakness or he was a disadvantaged child. And then you go back in your bedroom and go asleep again. What Leland was saying, you stay right awake and keep watching. Watch that nice woman. Watch old granny steal something. Yes, uh, go ahead. It's evident that you, in your present capacity, are supplying for anyone who wants them a tremendously hot kind of flame that is it's like an inferno or something if i may be very graphic and you know we do not want to go through it burning this is true i know but it's absolutely essential yes i'm just commenting on the process no i understand terrible but wonderful yes i'll cut we'll get you a garden i have a just one second. <laughs> yes, I just want to comment again on it. I'm trying to tell you that if you will go through the fear 
of being alone in the mansion, having kicked your friends out, little as to kick them, kick them, kick them. Your loneliness will grow, your fear will grow. You think you'll you you begin to think you're going to die. You don't know what's going to happen to you. You'll be whirled around. Everything in you screams to call those, come back, I forgive you, it's okay. After all, we all have our, our faults, we all make me, come back, be my friend again. I'm trying to tell you that as long as you do that, you'll just have to live in hell. We're trying to escape hell, and it is possible. I'm trying to say, if you will stay there, up in that house, Tell your friends to get out and watch how they lie and do every little, little thing to stay, keep staying, and you keep telling them to get out. If you'll stay there, you'll get to the point where your fear will kill you. When your fear kills you, you're, you come alive. He that endureth unto the end shall be saved. Gordon. Is the self attached to the guests or are they one and the same? It's Pardon? The self is attached to the guests or are they one and the same? The self is made up of all these guests. We're saying that in this group, all of us have said there's one small part of us that's tired of being a part of the madness. We've set, come, uh, come, stood aside and watched the madness. Don't carry the illustration too far or you'll wreck everything, mm -hmm. uh, Ernesto. I was reading a book this afternoon and I was in the same page for about 10 minutes, you know. I saw it was... Yes, and yeah, yeah. So, uh, I say, inside me, I talk to the thought, let me alone. And I feel a, a fear. You know? And I say that to the thought, you know, let me alone, don't bother me anymore. Huh. The reaction was fear, was a uh, emptiness. Mm -hmm. And then a fear. That's what you're talking about this time tonight. Or? Uh, I really didn't follow you. Uh, you're, you couldn't pay attention to the book. And now it go ahead. Was a, it was a thought, you know, all the time, you know. Yeah. That. So I said to this, I talked to the son. Oh, okay, all right. all right. So after that, I feel fear because uh, uh, inside me talk, talking to a thought, in that moment, I don't feel so. <laughs> yeah, be very careful. You're not just sitting there blabbing to yourself. <laughs> no, no, what's uh, more than that? Look, if, all right, all right. If you were saying, you stop nagging me. Right. This means that you have a certain awareness that something is nagging right. you, which means you're outside of it looking and seeing that nagging. That is good. Yeah. <coughs> After that, fear came, you know. I feel, uh, I never feel that before, so empty or... The more scared you get and the more conscious you get of your fear, the more you're setting yourself free of fear. Do you know brave people who are scared to death? Mm -hmm. Sure you do. Yeah. Your friends are brave people who are scared to death, aren't they? Mm -hmm. no, notice how they get their feelings hurt. Notice how careful you have to be with your brave friends that you don't offend, yeah. offend them. Yeah, right. Don't say, you know, the right wrong word. The worst thing we can ever do for ourselves is to find ways to push away the fear, to reduce it, to dilute it, to escape it. See, you won't face the fear of what happens when you catch your friends stealing things from you. You know why? This is, this is destroying your smug world to catch your friends in that. And, and if you permit them to continue to steal from you, you'll, you'll brand yourself a coward, by the way, which is false vanity and all that, but we won't go into that. Or, but, and if you know you have to kick them out, then you're going to have to go through another crisis. Why don't we just go ahead and do the work we have to do and get it over with? Why postpone it any longer? 
All we can do is pay the price for it. I'll, I'll give you a little help. I'll give you a right encouragement. Those friends inside you who are stealing your life away, they're laughing at your stupidity. You think they're your friends? They ride the hounds with you and have banquets with you? They're sneering at you behind your back and you don't know it. Maybe someday you'll hear two of them conversing about you. You'll overhear them talking about you and you'll see what kind of friends they are. But you're afraid to challenge them, aren't you? Aren't you? You're afraid that they might hurt you. Don't you know? Get it through your head. You get it through your head. The devil can never hurt you. He can only keep you hurt in your present state. See the difference in the two? He can't hurt who you really are. But you don't know who you really are. Therefore, you identify with the weak state in you and say, the devil can hit me and beat me up. If you were to die, how can the devil touch you? The devil can only touch the devil in you. A devil can only hurt another devil. If you're not a devil, can you be touched by the devil? Look at, look at what the devils are do, they're doing. They're tormenting us. Look what the little devil, medium-sized devil, did to Jim over one little incident. And how many that went on during that day that he didn't happen to catch? He caught that one, thankfully. Did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah. These flames that you produce, if I may... Uh publicly acclaim a certain feet burning of your own. Go ahead. These flames that you produce are obviously necessary to burn up the impurities that are in us. It appears to me that your particular role is that of the psychic surgeon. And the surgeon must know not merely where to insert the knife, but how deeply it should cut. In the last day, um, you, as the psychic surgeon, managed to increase my personal rage, that is my personal fury, to a level that I'm not sure that it's ever ex been experienced on that level before. And believe me, it was very close to the point where the surgeon stuck the knife into the heart and the patient died on the table. <clears throat> but, amazingly enough, it seemed to have been just far enough because as a result of this process, last night, in the course of the night, something cracked. And I don't think there's any going back. Congratulations. If you really mean it. Do you want it or don't you? You can have it if you want it. If you want to lie, if you want to stay asleep and pretend that all is well or that time itself will solve something then you'll have to be stolen from for the rest of your life, resenting it, hating yourself, hating your so-called friends. Pretending that you like them, pretending that they're good, that it's a good life. Mm -hmm. Look, look, it's not a good life at all. It's hell. It's torment. It's pretense. It's entrapment. 
There's not one of you here or listening to this tape who is not trapped by both interior and exterior circumstances you want to break out of. This is how to break out, and there's no other way. We're smashing the trap, and you are the trap. If you resist the smashing of yourself, that is the chasing out of all these unwanted guests, if you resist that, then you'll have to suffer from, you'll have to suffer from living with what you are. And that, by the way, is the only thing we really suffer from. From what I am, that's what I suffer from. Joe suffers from being Joe. By the simple fact of the explanation or the, the illustration you gave us of the many thievish guests we have in the house, just to see alone how much courage and how much strength it takes for us to stay awake even the first time to catch one thief, then be so shocked that we'd rather go to sleep for a whole week dreaming that it was not true, and then again have the courage to stay awake and catch another thing. In this alone, it is very clear that it takes years mm. of just calming down all our things. Mm. Before that, we cannot even begin really to break down these of All right, at a point, yes, very good. When you catch that thief, you're looking down and you see that thief taking the picture off the hooks and stealing that painting, you're hurt, mm -hmm. you're disappointed, yeah. and, and you say to yourself, well, that's not the way people, people surely aren't that way. Do you know why you say that? Yeah. Yeah. You are saying, I am surely not, you are the thief. with this I see this in myself the people I associate with I do not want to see them as they really are because then I have to really see how I am and this is the most horrifying thing I could experience mm You do, you do understand that we've wasted enough time already in our lives? Do you understand we don't want to waste any more time in pretense and in timidity? Mm -hmm. I don't want to waste any more time fooling around with my life. Do you? Don't play games with what we have here. This is serious business. Someday you'll see how serious it was, rightly serious, and how beautiful. Don't waste any more time. Don't you listen to those lying guests in your mansion. Don't you listen as they try to tell you that everything will be all right. As long as they're telling you that everything is going to be all right, it's going to be all wrong. You're going to have to be able, you're going to have to stay wide awake, up, up down there looking down, wide awake to see how they lie to you about everything. They lie to you. A liar has no choice but to lie. And you don't understand that. Because you... You are still conned by division in other people. The smiling liar. You believe the smile because he's so, he likes you. He smiled so nicely at you. What a beautiful smile he has. Say the sentence, Zena. Jack the Ripper. Has a lovely smile. Jack the Ripper has a lovely smile. Your one chance and the chance of every one of you is to come to this class and submit yourself to the truth and begin to understand you do not, 
you do not have to submit yourself to your past which is ruining your present right right That's probably the biggest thief of all, Vernon. The, the thief, you know, trying to keep you, you know, get you feeling guilty about what you've done in the past. What's the mistake we're making when we feel guilty about something we've done in the past? What's the error, Zena? Well, we're delving into our memory. We're not keeping ourselves where, where we are right now. That's right. There's many ways we can explain. You haven't canceled time. You've identified with memory, the memory part of you. Someday you'll be able to free yourself from yourself. Wouldn't that be nice? It can be done. I'm telling you, it can be done. I'm not lying to you. I am telling you the truth when I say that you can be free of who you presently imagine you are. And when you see that it's pure imagination, that is one of the powers that begins to dissolve it and the pain that goes with being who you imagine you are. Then you know what? You're free of every human being. Absolutely free of wrong dependency on every other human being on earth. You have, you have the power of the universe in you. And I'm not getting dramatic or religious. I'm telling you that you have the power of the universe in you. Then you won't have to get mad. You won't have to get mad at anything again evermore. So the false guest of anger can't torment you anymore. I've been watching me certain situation in the past where I thought I had to have a certain reaction. A reaction and then gave the reaction and as time went along and I observed myself a little bit, I know to certain situation I don't react anymore. And I want to specify. For instance, somebody says something carry and you think you have to be nasty back. You do not have to do that. Correct. If you actually see the falseness in a whole exchange of behavior, you can stand completely aside and do not react back the way you always thought you had to. Have you succeeded at that sometimes? In small way. Small way, yeah. Tremendous for me. Right. Yeah. Good. Good start. Yes. Uh -huh. Dauphine is beginning to give up a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. But learning, it's like, it's like a new world when you see that you, I mean, when you really see, not just saying. I understand. When you really see that you do not have to react back that way. That's right. It never occurred to me before. Are you beginning to see what real happiness is? Yes, it's a freedom. Happiness a is not being me. Yeah. <laughs> Rod. You know, when, when we tap a little tiny wall with a toothpick, it seems that, it, that we're smashing through a giant wall. There's so much energy in that when, when it's done. Say that again, Rod. Sometimes there's so much energy when, when we do something non-habitual, helping ourselves in, in a right way. It's like we're actually, we're tapping a little tiny wall with the toothpick, but it seems as if it's a... Uh, it, yes. Ah, that is good. That is very good, yes. The time will come when you'll see that you are tapping the wall with a, a toothpick. And, and the, listen, by the way, when you see that you're trying to knock down that stone wall with a toothpick, the minute you're aware of that, the, the toothpick grows 10 inches more. You understand? Yeah. You, yeah, you understand. another work exercise what it is uh, requires tremendous energy for instance when you have a conversation with someone and you try 
in that conversation, you know, the conversation makes actually no sense. And in that conversation, while you're either listening or speaking, try to remember something about the work, say a specific sentence. Mm. It takes so much energy and will actually to do that mm. because you much rather blab on, but you force yourself to call yourself in a way home. Okay. How is energy built? By using it? Yes. Okay. Uh, Larry. Mark and myself were recently on about a four-day trip, seeing people we haven't seen for several years. After we would leave their, their uh, company, he and I would discuss what has been said that made any sense at all, and it was such an infinitesimal amount of conversation that made any sense, any sense. Any final comments? In reply to Barry, what he said in, in connection with this, beginning to really to work on yourself in a very small way, you don't try to make much sensible conversations anymore because you know they're almost impossible. You know that you're not capable and that the other person is not capable of a sensible response. All right. We need all the help we can get in remembering basic truths. And I gave you one yesterday, which I want to review briefly and give you three examples on it. Do you remember yesterday I said that life proceeds according to certain decisions we make. And every time we make a decision, our life either goes upward or downward as a result of that decision. And there are several levels of that. For example, on the ordinary level, if you make a decision to get an education as a doctor or engineer, that at least gives you the upward path on making your living properly in this world. So you elevate yourself at least on the everyday level of being able to earn your own living and all that. But the main point was this. Professional writers are quite well aware of a certain thread that passes through all of human life, which I have just mentioned. That is, we proceed through life and make certain decisions, some of them major decisions. And the course of our life either goes up or down according to those decisions. And it's such a vast thing, we could talk on it for hours, but let me give you three examples so that you can begin to search for your own examples of this particular law, course, in which human beings travel so that you can see it both inside yourself and in other people so that when you make decisions you, it will make you conscious that you must make one authentically in favor of yourself because this is actually the way life operates now I said if you watch television shows or read novels you will see this law in operation not so much in the cops and robbers that you see on a half-hour TV show, but in more of the, the, the classic books. And I'm going to give you one example of that, or rather a movie example of it. All right, and if I haven't made myself clear, you could ask questions about it perhaps later after we have our talks. Historical example of what I'm trying to get through to you. Judas for 30 pieces of silver, made his decision to betray Christ, right? Okay. He made the decision to betray Christ, to reject the truth, to love darkness, to hate decency. He made that decision. As a result of that decision, and being paid in worldly rewards for it, he began to degenerate, did he not? Until it came where it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself, his life was not worth living anymore as a result of making this fatal decision against himself. That's one example. Second example, how many of you have ever seen the movie High Noon? 
Remember the movie with Gary Cooper? It's it's on TV now. Remember the plot of it? He was a sheriff sheriff of a town, had a girlfriend they were going to be married. And at the very beginning, the news was out that four or five gunmen were coming in on a noontime train. That is, they arrive in town at noon, and they were out to get the sheriff to kill him for some reason or other. So it started early in the day, and this suspense built up as it gradually built toward high noon, where there would be the confrontation in the streets, of course, between the sheriff and the thugs, gunmen who were coming in, the outlaws who were coming in to kill him. So the plot unfolded gradually, gradually, and first of all, his friends on the outer circle of his friendships began to fall away. They weren't going to side with the side of rightness in opposing the thugs who were coming to town. They fell away. Then closer and closer it came to him where even his own deputies said something like, well, Sheriff, you know I'm a family man. I, I can't afford to get mixed up in this sort of thing. So his own deputies deserted him. A little later, toward, as it got toward noon, close to noon, his lady friend got mad at him and told him to get out of there. Don't you face those men or I'll leave or I won't marry you or something like that. All the time, you see, the pressure was building in him. Which decision is he going to make to stay and do the right thing on the everyday level, of course, and keep the town clean of these outlaws? Or was he going to take off himself or surrender to them in some way, compromise with them, and lower the level of the quality of the town? So all the time, he has to think about which decision he was going to make. And, of course, everyone, everyone around him didn't make it easy. They made it as hard as possible. They wouldn't back up what was true and what was right. So he was all alone. And do you get the esoteric connection there? You were all alone. I am all alone in these spiritual battles that we have. So the time come, he was deserted by everyone in town, all the cowards in town who were his friends, who voted for him, his own deputies. The closest people to him had deserted him. So here it was, noon, the train come chugging into town, the thugs got off, and there you could see their guns, and they were, you know, they make them unshaven so they look tough. So he had to make his decision of whether he was going to go out in the street and meet them or take off himself. And, of course, he stood up for what was right, what he knew was true. He's going to rid the town of the evil thugs, which he did, as it turned out. Uh, there was the big gun battle and they got killed and he saved the town try to see this sort of thing and it, it, while it may be in form of entertainment there's something very basic in it decisions that you and I make every day and I'll tell you you are going to be deserted and you had better be deserted by your false friends both out there and your false thoughts up there they're going to lie to you and eventually desert you and good the best thing that can happen to you is for you to stand all alone. That's the only way you'll find what is really your own.